Hey everybody, it's Monika and welcome to my channel where I help social workers, therapists, and helping professionals deepen their level of self-awareness while increasing their competence and confidence in the profession. So for today's video, I wanted to talk about how to work with challenging clients. What should you do when you're working with those court mandated clients or people who just don't want to be there? So if you're interested in this topic, then please keep watching. I'm Anika Thomas, the founder and clinical social worker at Kindred Connections Therapy Center. I've been a social worker for over 12 years. I decided to do an entire YouTube channel on my journey from cubicle working social worker to successful entrepreneur. Welcome to my channel. So I have to say, Working with challenging clients are some of the clients that I enjoy working with the most. Now that wasn't always the case. It really took some patience, some skill development, and some knowledge to know exactly what was going on with the client, why they were presenting the way that they were presenting, and then learning how to have a level of self-awareness to where I wasn't taking what they did or what they said personally. So once I was able to gain and develop that level of knowledge and education, I really enjoyed the challenge of working with resistant clients or clients who didn't want to um, come into therapy or who didn't want to work with me um, as their social worker. So I always challenge myself to be able to get them to open up, to answer my questions, to be able to start talking. And it was always that spark, that one moment when I was able to get them to start talking and I was able to reel them in and I was like, okay, I got you. Now I know from this point we can begin developing a relationship. So I really found a satisfaction from that because I, again, I never took a client's presentation personally once I learned some of the skills that I'm gonna talk to you about today. So one of the things that I had to learn early on was thinking about behavior from a functional model, meaning I had to look at the behavior and say, what is the function or the purpose of the behavior? So instead of taking what the client was doing personally, when I began reframing it in that way, I was able to make a different meaning about the resistance or about the challenge behavior that the client was displaying. So what that could look like is when I had a client who was challenging or quote unquote difficult or resistant, I could take that to mean that the client was challenging my authority, that they didn't want to follow through on the plan, that they were just being defiant, they wanted to do things their way, um, they wanted to make my job hard, or they wanted to prove that they can hold their stance or their position uh, despite what I said or despite what I suggested. So whenever I made it about me, I missed the opportunity to understand the function of the behavior, meaning what is this behavior behavior trying to communicate to me or what is it trying to do for the client? So when I understood the behavior as something that was protective, meaning if a client is resistant, what does resistant do? What does resistant mean? And what is the purpose of it? What's the function of it? So if a client is coming to me, they don't know me, I'm asking personal questions, I'm involved in their life at a level to where they feel extremely uncomfortable and they're required to work with me, it may feel that I've, I've removed or I've ripped away some of their power, some of their control, some of their agency, some of their uh, right to determination. So when I began looking at it from that frame, then I could begin to say, how would it feel? So this is where empathy comes in. How would it feel being someone who was a grown woman or a grown man, having someone come into your, your, your life and to rob you of that agency or to rob you of that control or to give the perception that you don't know how to parent or that you, you're irresponsible or you don't take care of your responsibilities. So then I know that that can create some defensiveness from a person where they can feel like they need to maintain their stance. They need to show that they're not the person who I think that they are. And they're not going to give me any leeway to get to know them or to get to any challenge that they could potentially be having because that would mean that I was right about them and, and I don't know them. So whenever a client is trying to maintain that position or maintain a stance, I honor it as that and I respect it as that and I understand that this is what you have to do to be protective. This is what you need to do to maintain yourself and to create a sense of safety for yourself and I'm not going to take that personally because I know that this is what you need to do to survive in this moment. So that was one of the things that I had to do was to be able to learn the function of the behavior. The second thing that I had to learn to do was to understand the different brain states. And I was able to learn brain states through my work of um, understanding conscious discipline. So when I work with young children, I was able to understand the conscious discipline model and the three brain states that are explained in the model. And I'll put an image here 
um, if you want to check that out. Now, conscious discipline is often used for children in a preschool setting, but it applies for anyone because it really does a good job of explaining where people are in their psychological brain state and then how they're going to respond and behave based off of where they are. So in the model, they describe three brain states. So you have your survival brain, your emotional brain, and your executive brain. And when you're in your survival brain, there are certain behaviors and things that you will be doing and saying. So survival is when you are kicking, hitting, slapping, punching, doing things to protect yourself, saying things to protect yourself. So when I interact with a quote unquote resistant client, I understand that they're in that survival state and the resistance, the hitting, kicking, slapping, punching, yelling, screaming, um, pushing away, running away. That's all a protective mechanism. That's a way for them to create a sense of safety. So when I think about what brain state is this client operating in, then I know what interventions to use based off of that brain state. So again, I'm not taking it personally, but I'm, I'm honoring and recognizing where they are in the moment. So one of the things that you want to be mindful of when a client is in an emotional brain state, they lose access to their executive brain. So the executive brain is the part of your brain where the decision making, problem solving, good choices, thinking things through where that takes place and where that happens. That prefrontal cortex, the uh, part of your brain where your executive functioning takes place. Now, when a client is in their survival state or when they're resistant or being quote unquote difficult, they're in that survival state and they don't have access to the executive state. So it doesn't make sense for me to try to logic or reason with that person or talk things through in a way for them to understand or for me to make things make sense or for them to comprehend because that part of the brain is shut off when they're in their survival state. So when they're there, it's my responsibility to reinforce the safety, to ensure that they feel safe, to let them know that I'm not a threat to their safety. That will then calm the nervous system where they no longer see me as a threat. So I know in that moment, that's my job and that's the work that I need to be doing internally is to be able to create a sense of safety for them. So one of the things that also helped uh, was my understanding that the client, when they come into me and they are resistant or they've been mandated um, to do some level of work, that the client is not there to be fixed. It's not my responsibility to fix the client. It's to be able to meet the client where they are, to understand why they're there or why they believe that they don't need to be there. So I have to get right where they are to be emotionally empathetic to get to the emotional parts of what they're saying and to be able to reframe that and give it back to them, letting them know that I understand what they're going through and what they're saying. And that it's my role to be on the journey along with them to get to the end goal and that we're working together in a partnership. So I always think to myself that the work that I do with clients, it should always feel like a dance where we're dancing together. It should never feel like you're wrestling with your client as if you're trying to get one up on them or they're trying to get one up on you or that you're in some type of power struggle with your client. So whenever you notice you're in a power struggle with your client, you want to be able to back off, take a breath, stop, and be able to reevaluate how you can begin navigating that relationship in a different direction. So one of the other things that I had to learn how to do because I was looking at the function of the behavior, I didn't want to pity my client. I didn't want to feel sorry for them. I did want to have empathy with them. Um, so when I had empathy, I was relating to that, what they could possibly be experiencing. I was using their language. I was saying how it could potentially feel that they had to do something that they didn't want to do, how powerless it probably made them feel, how it made them feel like people are always controlling their lives and telling them what to do and telling them where they can go and who they can associate with. And I would connect with them on how that probably feels. It probably frustrates you or makes you angry that all of these people have all this control over your life and can dictate what you want to do and who you are. And you're a grown man. And as a grown man, you probably feel like you should have the agency over your own life. And having me in your life and all of these other people in your life, I could imagine it feels like it takes that away from you. So you want to be able to validate what they're feeling in that moment, be able to speak back to them what that experience could be like, and then allow them to open up to see if that can bring down some of the resistance and then create some level of vulnerability where they can begin sharing what that feels like. So lastly, I would say that you want to empower without 
patronizing. So when you're in a therapeutic dynamic or a helping relationship with someone who you perceive to be resistant, that can be a trigger for you. So you have to do your own work. You have to go inside because you might be attempting to be calm. You might be attempting to be patient. You might be attempting to be nice, but it can come across as very patronizing. So you want to be mindful of that and be mindful of your own triggers and ensure that you're not patronizing the client because oftentimes they can pick up on that and it makes the situation worse because they don't perceive you to be genuine and they don't perceive you to be on their side and they see you as a threat to their safety just like other people are a threat to their safety. So you want to make sure that when you're being empathetic that you're doing it with genuineness. And when I say empower without patronizing, it means you wanna speak life into your client. You wanna let them know that you see a different side of them or a different perspective of them and you believe that from your core being that it's not right that men should be treated that way and that is not your intention to treat this client in that way. Your intention is to treat them with dignity and respect because you see them as an equal human being just like you. So you wanna be able to empower them using that type of language so they can see you as someone who's relatable, who's right there with them, helping them work through the things that you need to work through. In addition to building that alliance, you also wanna let the client know the boundaries that would need to be set in that relationship. So you wanna be very clear letting the client know even though I'm more than willing to have this interaction with you. I'm definitely here to help you reach towards your treatment goals and to make sure that you can work through this situation the best way possible. But with that, with me being a professional and functioning in this role, these are the things that I'm also responsible for doing as well. And these are the things that I'm not gonna be able to do. I'll fully be able to support you in these things, but I'm not gonna be able to do this and I'm probably not gonna be able to do this either. So you wanna be very clear, very direct, very upfront, very assertive with your client because sometimes when clients are resistant or when clients are challenging, they sometimes have a tendency to test you to see how far they can push you away, how mean they could be to you, how negatively they can talk to you just to see if you'll stick around, to see if you'll stay, to see if you'll move away. So they're used to using their language and their words as tools to push people away. I'm not saying that you have to stay and take it, but I want you to understand the function of the behavior. The function of the behavior is to push you away because they're wanting you to prove whether or not you're like everyone else or whether you'll stick around. So you'll have to decide for yourself how much of that are you willing to take, how much of that do you want to tolerate, and how much of that are you gonna push back on. Sometimes you can absolutely push back against resistant clients, but you wanna have a delicate balance of when you do it and how you do it because it can absolutely sabotage the relationship if you don't do it correctly. So in my own professional career, I have worked with clients who have been difficult or challenging, and I've made it a point for myself to begin to redefine and reframe the words that I use to describe the client. I very rarely use resistant clients. I very rarely use the word challenging clients. I always try to use a strength-based definition for my clients so that I can see them in a different lens. Now, I don't do that all the time. There are some clients that I, I truly struggle with working with. But for the most part, I've done a really good job of being able to understand the function of the behavior, to understand that the brain state that the client is in, to be able to use empowering language without patronizing, to not be judgmental, and to not make it about myself and do my own internal work so that I'm not triggered by the client's behavior. So I hope this video was helpful for you. If it is, please like, subscribe, or share it. I'll be uploading more videos to help you deepen your level of self-awareness and to increase your competence and confidence in the profession. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, be well.